So as I opened with this morning before worship, it's very heavy about the truth in our hearts. Because when we get to the really deep things or parts of walking with God, it's never as well, it's actually very simple. It's very, very simple. But the problem is, it's not as simple as we think. But it is very simple. Now, I think the biggest mistake, well, there are two big mistakes people do in their walk with God. They chase a position they're not given. So people chase anointing, they'll chase pastoralship, they'll chase a miraculous gifting, they'll chase prophetic, they'll chase some form of position of authority within the body of Christ. This is the first mistake. People chasing something they're not meant to have. Or secondly, the second mistake people make is they don't accept the position they're given. So some people will run from their anointing, like Jonah. They run from what God's called them to be. Or, there's the other side of the spectrum. People don't understand their position within the church and how to serve within the body of Christ. And it all comes from the same root as what I was talking about, of, of have we truly died to ourself? Have Christians truly, truly, truly died to self? Or are we still falling under deception? Are we truly living for the glory of Jesus? Or are we still living to glorify and comfort ourselves? Now, sadly, the truth is, for most people, it's they're living to glorify themselves. They're living to comfort their life. Which isn't what Jesus did. Jesus cried in the Garden of Gethsemane, Lord, please take this cup away, but... As it's your will, help me to endure it. He didn't run from the suffering that came from his anointing or his calling or his position. So when we understand the truth of the gospel, which is fully unattainable by man and only possible through the empowering of the Holy Spirit, you start to understand we need to live a life that means we die to self. When we accept the crucifixion, death and resurrection of Christ, us too must be crucified to the cross. Which means when you are baptized and born again, your old you is left on the cross. And it's a new you resurrected, not for glory today. For an eternal glory that we have faith in. So because we have faith in an eternal glory, we choose to die today. We choose to suffer today. And that's where we're going to be digging into for a while. Learning to die to ourself. So the biggest mistake that people make the biggest mistake people make is they believe the church now someone asked me and I'm sure he'll be listening to this how is it you know so much you've been born again just over three years how do you know so much did you do theology at university did you do religious how do you know so much and I said to him, I, I like to read. 
I like to read. But the honest answer as I reflected on it, how do I know so much? And I said, and I said God, I know you've gifted me the ability to read, to learn, to digest. But then I look at the stupid book collection and it hit me this morning as Danielle is reading a book which I haven't read yet. And I said, that's how I've gotten to know so much. I listened to the Holy Spirit from the beginning of my journey. He's the one that told me what to read, when to read and how to read it. So most of those books I've read, but there are some books I haven't read. But I've bought them under the prompting of the Holy Spirit in faith. And Danielle was reading one of those this morning. I said, well, that's how I've gotten to know so much in only three and a half years is because I said, Holy Spirit, you teach me. Jesus, you teach me. God, you teach me. The biggest mistake people do is they go to the church saying, church, you teach me. So the talk for today is titled, Are you living under the tradition of the elders? So we'll turn to Mark chapter 7. What Bible version do you have success? NIV. NIV. Oh, very good. Can you read for us, please? Mark chapter 7, verse 1, until... Let's go until the end, until 23. Uh, chapter 7, verse 1 to 23. Sexual immorality, thefts, 
never above you. Greek, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and the Thank you so much, success. So we see here Jesus talking and re- uh, debating with the Pharisees, with the church at the time. And the people didn't understand. Why aren't your disciples washing their hands? Why haven't they come? Why haven't they washed their hands seven times before eating? Why are they eating with, with, uh, with dirty hands? Don't, don't they know what to do? And the same thing happens in today's world. In Christianity, in charismatic movements, within religious systems, not just Catholicism, Orthodox, Anglican. They go, it's just the way it is. But just because that's the way it is, doesn't mean that's correct. So when we look in today's churches and... You know, I was speaking to a brother about it and he needs to speak to his pastor to try and get some advice. And he's been trying for almost one week to get hold of the pastor. And I hope today he's speaking to that pastor. But that's a problem. How is it it's taken more than a week for someone who's in need to try and get hold of their pastor? That's a problem with a religious system. Ah, but that's just the way it is. No, that's not the way it is. That's not the way it's meant to be. The people in leadership are meant to serve the sheep. They're meant to be like Jesus, who lays down their rights to serve their community. Ah, but pastors have always got good salaries. It doesn't mean it's correct. Because the Bible shows us that people in leadership are meant to use their goods to serve others. Ah, But, you know, you have to have your own privacy. That's what the world teaches. The Bible teaches us to open our doors to each other as family. Ah, but the Bible says you have to worship in the temple. Yes, the Jewish temple. And then they worshipped in houses. So if you don't have a Jewish temple, you worship in your house. Ah, but the Jews are cut off and we're now an inherited race. We're now the chosen people. No. The book of Revelations very clearly shows we are grafted in. We are not replacements. Ah, you are allowed to sin. It's okay. Jesus forgives you. Don't worry about it. You can keep on sinning. We're always going to sin. We're imperfect. And until we are resurrected, we're always going to sin. No, that's not what the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us, yes, we will always sin, but we do not allow sin. We must change. Oh, it's okay. You let people come into your church. Don't worry about it. If they don't change, you trust the presence of God to change them. No, but that's wrong. The Bible tells us we have to cut off from our church community those who choose to be unholy. Now, you can start. Now, I'm just picking the obvious things. These are the obvious things within the church system that people just take as, well, this is just the way it is. But that's not the way it is. And these are all things which we have to reflect on in our lives and our walks with God is, are we behaving and doing things because that's what the Bible tells us or because it's what the church has told us? Because this is really important for you. You can't take what I teach you as gospel. Everything I teach, you take to the word of God. And if I'm wrong, we can have a discussion. It'll be great. But if I'm right with the word of God, you then have a choice to make to change or not to change. I think I've spoke about this before, but the biggest mistake people make is they'll come to church and they don't change. So for me, as I've been sitting with the Lord this week, and he's really highlighting a lot of things to me about the truth of how I behave, what I do, 
you know, speaking with the same brother I was just mentioning earlier, I was like, gosh, I've got such a long way to go till I've died to self. I've really got a long way to go. I'm not even close there yet. The Holy Spirit, when you let him speak to you, will tear apart all of your self-glorifying things when you decide to yield to the honesty of your heart. And the Holy Spirit can really be quite mm, more strict than a wife telling you you can't have chocolate cake on a Saturday night because I had cake on Friday night and I'm now allowed cake once a night, once a week. But the fundamental truth that I'm going to be poking at for this next season is as a church, as people all here, are you taking what's being taught and applying it? If you're not applying it, why not? If it's because you don't believe I preach the word of God, why do you come? If it's because you believe I preach the word of God, have you checked it to the word of God? If you've then checked it to the word of God and it's proven to be true, why haven't you changed? Because there are several things that can come into it, but they all come to the same root. A reluctance to die. Because I preach a, a very challenging message, and I thank God, I do thank God, because I sit here every morning before church, and I go, Lord, if a new Christian comes to church today, they're going to run a mile. If someone who's an atheist comes to church with this message, they're going to run a mile. Because this is not easy teaching. This isn't, yeah, you're forgiven, we raise a hallelujah, your life is going to be good, you're going to be happy, you're going to have money, you're going to have a nice house, you're going to have a husband, you're going to have a wife. You're going to, no, what I preach is you're going to die, you're going to suffer, and your life is going to be horrible, but you're going to have the glory of God in your life, which is going to give you an ability to endure things that makes the world go, how in the heck? How in the heck do they live the lives they live, and they smile? How in the heck do they give away what they have when they do it with joy? How in the heck is white, black, yellow, brown, orange, every color of the world's nationalities sitting together and sharing food? But then this is the thing. I'm not here to evangelize. I'm not here to preach a nice message I'm here to teach you the truth and you then have to go am I willing to accept the truth or not because I've sat with the Lord over this and I'm like Lord where's the growth where's the change where's the multiplication and the Lord said I'm not ready yet and I'm like okay and he's then showing me where I'm going wrong where I've still got a lot to die to self and I go okay I've got it God I've got a lot of work to be done. Then how can I communicate this message to the church? But us as a church that comes here to this building have decisions to make in our lives. Because no one forces you to come. No one forces you to listen. You come freely you listen freely. It's your choice as to what you will do with it. In the same way Jesus teaches the parable of the talents, you can see every teaching that comes out of this church as a talent that's been given to you. Will you do something with it? Will you make a change in your life? Will you start to step in the right direction? So as we go back to digging about self and elders and listening to churches, whatever I teach, reflect back. Have you been making change in your life over what's been taught? And I've said this many times. If your life is the same today as it was last month, as it was three months ago, as it was six months ago, as it was one year ago, are you being a tree? Or are you being a rock? Because trees 
or vines grow. They bear fruit. They change. They change to the environment they're in. Rocks do nothing. They stay the same. They're useless. We are living trees that bear fruit. We are grafted into the vine. We are grafted into the living vine that is Jesus. All of the trees and things we have that's living change. So we too must change. So we must reflect. Have we grown in the past seasons? If not, you can think, have I fallen into the trap of the church system? Because the trap of the church system is I come here every Sunday, I clap, I worship, we listen, make some highlighting, make some notes, go, oof, that was, that was a tough message. Then we go home and we don't change. It's like I taught the other week, the parable of the seeds. If the devil has come, he's taken the seed and there's been no change in our lives. Because even the way we look at church is a trap. It's a tradition of the elders. Coming to church once a week because it's just what we do is nonsense. The book of Acts shows those who have encountered the presence of God, truly, devoted themselves daily to the teachings. Devoted them daily to the act of breaking bed. Devoted themselves daily to singing psalms and hymns. There's nothing in the Bible about once a week raise a hallelujah. So we have to then stop and go, how are we spending our time? Are we making changes or are we, have we fallen into the habit of church? Because you can go to the best church in the world, the most anointed, the most spirit-led, with the heavy presence of God. And even the Bible shows, by the book of, end of book of Acts, people were already falling away. The letters show 30, 40, 50, 60 years after Jesus' resurrection, the churches were falling away. The book of Revelations, the final warning to the churches, the churches were falling away. You cannot rely on the church system for your salvation. You have to rely on your relationship with the Lord. And it comes here in Mark 7 at the end. From verse 21. From within, out of people's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, thefts, murders, adultery, greed, evil actions, deceit, self-indulgence, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a person. Now, I'm going to paraphrase this into real-life thoughts. And this is just taking what Jesus teaches on the Sermon of the Mount. Now what Jesus teaches on the Sermon on the Mount is, if you look at a woman and you find her attractive, you, it's already the same as adultery. That's the truth of the judgment that comes. So let's see. From out of people's hearts come evil thoughts. Ah. Oh. The system here is so unfair. Because I'm black Nigerian man, I can't get a job. I wish I could get my revenge on this country. It's not fair. Evil thought. Being unhappy at your country is an evil thought. Sexual immorality. Oh, he or she is attractive. Oh, that's sexual immorality. Boom. Done. Forget it. Theft. Well, theft is the same as coveting your neighbor's goods. Oh, they have such a nice house. How blessed they are. I wish I had a house like that. Boom. That's theft. That's your heart done. Forget it. Murders. Oh, that person is so annoying. Murder. That person makes me do extra work. Murder. 
that person's lady, lazy, evil thoughts. They didn't, nothing has to come out. Deceit. Ah, it's okay. They don't need that help. Someone else will sort them out. No, I'm good with God. I, I, I know what I'm doing. I don't need to do those extra prayer meetings. Ah, I don't need to study the Bible. I know God's word. I know God's ways. Deceit. self indulgence I need to have that extra slice of cake. Oh, deary me. Oh, I go down hook, line, and sinker on self-indulgence with cake. That's why I'm down to one a week. Kill that evil root of cake and sweeties. Pride. Pride is such an easy one to fall under. I know what I'm doing. I'm right. I've got the gifting. I've got the anointing. I already know. I'm right, they're wrong. I'm better than them. They don't know. That's pride. You see how easy it is to be deceived in the heart. If you were stopping and being honest, if you stopped and was honest for one second about why you do what you do, you'll see how that will tear you to shreds. In one second. Why? People live like that in the heart because we still haven't died to self. Now, I hope success. I don't mind. I'm just going to use you as an example. I'm not saying this is you. I'm just using you as an example because it's a relevant example for all of us because we're all in a foreign country. It's, I said to say, why are you in Dubai? And most of us, him included, said to get a better job, a better quality of life. Why? To have more money. To have a better house. Why? To look after my kids. Why? Because I've got to give them an inheritance. Why? Because you don't trust God. You haven't died to self. That's why. Or, oh, it's so hard in, I'm using as an example, I'm not saying this is true. Life is so hard in Nigeria. Why? Why? Because I don't eat. Why? Because I'm, there's nothing here. Well, so why are you leaving? Because I need to have a better quality of why. Because you haven't yet died to self. You still don't trust God. When we're still focusing on what we need, we haven't died to self. Does that make sense? When we're still living for what we need or what we believe the world tells us we need or even what the churches teach us we need, we still haven't died to self. Because fundamentally, what does Jesus teach us in his prayer to the Lord? Please give us our daily bread. Not our inheritance bread. Not our next life's bread. Not our great grandchildren's bread. What, what happened to the servant who buried his talents? He was a servant of the Lord. He got given his talents. He buried them and did nothing with them. What happened to him? Hmm? Got thrown into hell. With a gnashing of teeth. Where the fire doesn't burn. And the maggots never die because he didn't use his treasures he buried it so when we're building an inheritance for next year for next generation guess what we haven't died to self greed we are being like the Israelite people that said on the first day oh all this manna And tried to store up the extra. And what did God do? Took it away. One reason 
potentially people as Christians are not successful in business or with money is because they're trying to hoard it. So God takes away the hoarding. Because people still hold money as an idol. Why do people lose jobs sometimes? Because you hold it as an idol. And a loving God says, this is an idol, my child. Let me take this away from you. You're not focusing on me yet. You're not living to glorify me yet. You're still living for you. It's all for you. So I'll take it away in the hope that you'll come back to me. But people still don't listen. They go back to trying to hoard. Me, 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 me. It's all for me. It's all for me. I know what I'm doing. It's all for me. But it's not for you. It's absolute nonsense. It's the biggest deception in the New Testament church that your life is here to, 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 to be nice to receive blessing, to receive glory, to have an inheritance, so that through your success you get to glorify God. It's the biggest load, and I, I almost want to swear about it, it's the biggest load of polycock. I think that's as, as, as brutal as I can get. It's polycock, it's absolute nonsense. But it's the truth. I've been there. I remember when I first started walking with God. You know, at, at this early stage of my walk, we were like, Oh, we'll pray for you. Bam, demon manifests. Oh my gosh, in Jesus' name, de demon, get out. Like, deaf ears were opened. Literally, hearing aid to no hearing aid. Eyes were healed. Couldn't read, now could read. And I remember praying to God. Ronnie remembers my Jeep. I used to have my Jeep, and this was like my, my car. And I was like, Lord, that client of mine, he's got all the money in the world. I asked you, Lord, move his heart to pay for a V8 engine swap into my Jeep. I pray, Lord, give him, make him pay 80000 to upgrade my Jeep so that we can, show, we can show him, the Muslims, that you're real. People will know you're walking with me, God. Give me that V8 engine swap. I'm not joking. That was a prayer I prayed. Uh, how does that sound very simple? Please, God, give me a job in this country where it's impossible. It's the same nonsense. It's so you can be glorified. And we're trying to justify that God will be glorified through us being made comfortable. And it's a nonsense of the church. It's the nonsense of deception of self that the devil plants in people's brains. And the bigger the person's anointing becomes, the easier that plant, that seed takes place. Because then it then becomes Lord Give me that miraculous power so your ministry here can spread. Give me the anointing of healing, of prophecy, of this and that, so that people will know your, your name is real, Jesus. Then this church will grow. Then all the Muslim people will come. It sounds good. But it's nonsense. You get to the root of it. It's my church. I should be praying, Lord, make a church rise up so I can fall under them and serve them it doesn't have to be me it's you that needs to be glorified it's why there are so many churches because every single church is saying I'm right I'm right and I know the hypocrisy because I'm another one here saying we're right it's why there's so much division because the people who are in charge are not serving themselves. They're not serving God. They're serving themselves to make their name great. To make their promise look good. And then they can then go, look at what the Lord does through me. Jesus is real. Look at all of this. Who's getting the glory? Jesus or him? Him. His ministry. Church is named after him. People go for him. They don't go for Jesus, they go for him. They don't go for Jesus, they go to see the miracles that may happen. They don't go for Jesus, they go because they hear this church gives out blessings. And that poison happens because people haven't died to self. And then that poison spreads. And the way this poison starts is when people focus 
on building their kingdom here. It can start from building your church here. It can then go down to building your family home. It can then go down to building your career. It can then go down to building your wardrobe. It can be anything. Anything on this world can be turned into an idol that will corrupt you, pollute you, and tear you down. And the devil will throw things at you to tempt you, and boom! Like a baseball bat, boff, you're gone. And we saw it with one of the girls that was coming next door. Claims to be a Christian. British passport holder. Offered to come work part-time. So she was happy to go from a very high per hour position to accept a part-time position where the part-time salary was the equivalent of less than one day's work for her for a whole month. Just to contextualize where her heart was when she started. Because she, she felt a calling to do an internship to try and help children. And it just turned up for her. Now starts... She's now starting to give therapy to the kids. She's now saying, oh, I can, I can talk to kids. I can, this is, I'm not, it's not as bad as I thought. What comes? Da, 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 da. I have a job for you. I would like for you to open a holistic center. It's all yours. Do it whatever you want. Blank slate, blank check. Big salary, visa, health insurance, company car. Just work full time for me. Ah, gone. Taking it. The irony of the starting interview was I don't work for money. But yet it was money that tempted and took away. It's a great opportunity. Something like this never comes along. I don't even know how it happened. But they just approached me. Yeah, good, because you were starting to walk into something called self-sacrificial love and not working for money and working to help other people and actually stepping into the self-sacrificial love of Christ and the devil just went... <clears throat> ah, she bit. You see how easy it is? So easy for Christians to be tempted when they go, ah... Nicer paycheck. Even for me this morning, I was doing my, my morning God time before church and I was just praying over one of my high profile clients. I was like, Lord, what do you want me to do with this? Do you want me to I speak to him? I can offer him like a part time, full time position where I'll help him. I'll teach his chef and I'll do this and I can do that, Lord, and then we can do it for a salary. And then God was like, What are you doing? This is meant to be your season of trusting in me to provide. Why are you coming to me with solutions to make a monthly salary contract with this client? And I was like, eh. I'll shut up. Thank you, God. Yeah. But you see how easy that, that could have been for me. I can contact him. Listen, I know your health is suffering. You're really stuck. Hey, I can come and help you and fix all these things. Monthly contract, part-time salary. House is now happy. Got salary coming in. Makes life for baby easier. Boom. But what I forgot is this was meant to be a season of pure reliance in God in faith to provide everything we needed. Me coming to him with a solution isn't faith. Faith is God, you provide, which is him contacting me going, Eloy, I want to hire you full time. That's faith. Faith is not me going to him. Faith is me manipulating So you can see how easy it is for us to live for self when we're not being honest. It's so easy. It's so, so easy. We've literally seen God multiply food in front of us. We've seen God multiply money. Yet even for us, we have stress and go, we need to find work. I need to find clients. I need to find consults. We need more kids. When we stress about these things, what does it mean? 
It means I still don't know God good enough to trust him to provide what I need today. You know, I was saying to the other brother that I mentioned earlier, I said, you know, I've realized it. Like, God's really poking me. The money I've sold from the Jeep is still sat in a savings account because I don't know what to do with it. Now, wisdom is to wait till God tells me to do something with it. But unwisdom is also to sit on it and just save it. So, like, hold it. I know for me, I'm waiting for after child is born to then release that because we don't know if our health insurance is going to cover. We've got the cheapest of the cheapest health insurance, the minimum one, because that's what the law stated, which covers absolutely nothing for us. It's absolutely useless. It just steals money every year because our faith is in God to heal us. And if God wants us to be sick, God wants us to be sick. But the cheapest cost to give a birth here is 10,000 dirhams. Cheapest. That's the minimum package you'll pay to give birth in Dubai. No complications, no uh, epidurals, no aftercare. That's you go in, boop, out, eh, clean, go. That's in and out on the same day. 10,000 dirhams. <laughs> I've got to put something, I've got to make sure that's there for now. But just talking an example from myself. Whether God can poke me when I'm praying for more money. So, well, do I still have money in savings? You know? But this is how the whole thing comes. And I, I spoke about it briefly a few days ago. Then one very hard thing for us is trusting our family in the hands of God. Now, all of us here as expats, as in we all have homes, Malawi, Nigeria, China, Nigeria, Britain. One of the hardest things is to leave your family at home. To leave home at home. Now what do I mean by this? Jesus teaches the parable about the, the barnyard owner. You know the one I'm talking about? The man with the barn? And then he, his barn is full, so he builds a bigger barn. And then when he builds his bigger barn, what happens? He dies. And then where does he go? Hell. So even for us as expats, that bigger barn theology is the same as our finances. Are we storing for a tomorrow that may never come? Are we storing for the day that may never come? Are we going, right, one nest egg? <clears throat> Let's make a second nest egg. Oh, good boy, yes. We're making nest eggs, thank you. No, make a second nest egg. We've got two nest eggs. Right, one more year. One more year in Dubai. Ah, three nest eggs. I'm ready to go home. Baseball bat, gone. And you've built, you're wasted three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten years building nest eggs for a home you may never go to. Why? Because you haven't died to self. You're still living for a future that may never come. Living for a retirement that may never come. You know, it's my biggest fear. It's a genuine fear of mine that I have. I'm like, Lord, if I live to the age of 80, which I don't think I will, <laughs> if I live that long, God, I have no pension. There is no investment plan in place. I'm going to be working until the day I die. Oh God, I can't, be, I can't be putting people's weights on their bars, doing nutrition plans when I'm... I can't be doing that. Lord. Oh. I think what's going to happen for your baby when he comes? He's got 
schooling fees. I was sitting on it this morning. He says, you're going to have schooling fees? That's like uh, ten to 20,000 durhams a year. If we teach... 100,000 dirhams a year. I don't, we don't earn that much. Like, what? What are you doing, God, you know? The truth of the matter is, it's we, we then have to stand in faith. God always provides, and I, I do all the accounting, and it makes me chuckle. We always get exactly what we need every single month. We don't go up, we don't go down. We spend more, God puts more in. We spend less, God doesn't put as much in. It's the same. We're plus and minus the same. Every single month, God gives us exactly what we need to pay off. Our, I put everything on a credit card, because with a credit card you get benefits, like discounts and stuff, and then from there I pay it off at the end of the month. God gives us exactly the amount we need every single month. I don't sit and analyze. I don't sit and save. I don't sit and prepare. I just pray over every single decision. And then God provides. Most decisions. Hmm? That one was a, a definitely a base. That was a definite baseball bat. That was one of those. Uh, that was a baseball bat moment. <laughs> <laughs> I had a moment where I went a little bit cuckoo with teddy bears. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can get him teddy bears. And when I was a kid, we used to have, I had one teddy bear as a tiger. And it had like a little metal thing on the ear. And I was never allowed to play with it because it was so expensive, apparently. And we was never allowed to play with this teddy. And I was like, right, I can get him teddies. Let me get him the ones with the tags, right? I'm going to get him all of them. It's got like, 12 teddies with the ear tags because I wasn't allowed. That was a definite baseball bat moment. <laughs> but most of us will say there's nothing wrong with buying your kid teddy bears. You just want to love him. No, there's everything wrong with buying him 12 or 13, 14, 15 teddy bears. <laughs> it was a definite moment of madness. And I've recognized it and I've said sorry with God about it, but. It's, to most of us, that doesn't sound insane. Well, if you've got blessing, why not? No, there's everything wrong with it. Because that's living for self. That's greed. That's gluttony. That's self-indulgence. He needs one teddy bear. Maybe two of the same one. So when one's being washed, he's, you can punk him. That he's always got one to stop him crying. That's wisdom. To get two of the same one. Getting 15 different animals so he's got his own like zoo is definitely not wisdom. But he's got his own zoo. I should have laughed. But this is the truth. This is the truth of heart corruption. It's so easy to make it, ah, oh, well, you know, we, I'm here to serve the Arab people and this and that. And then my clients, they're going to understand it and it's going to look like we're normal people to them. And but it, I can create all sorts of deception in my heart about why it was okay to buy him 15 teddy bears of different animals. Well, they're the only toys he's getting. He's not going to have an iPad. He's not going to know what a TV is. Forget PlayStation. He's going to be playing imaginary zoo, imaginary Noah's Ark, until he's like my age. <laughs> so as we come back to scriptures, that was a good tangent. Eloy, you're being a little bit ridiculous, I think. You're definitely not talking the word of the Lord, I hear you say. What do you mean, die to self, all this? You're, you're talking nonsense. Don't build an investment fund. Don't build inheritance. Don't build a restoration. Don't build, don't build. Just focus on God and your heart. What nonsense, I hear people thinking. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 2. Chapter 2. Now I'm going to read, oh no, Daniel, can you read for me verses 1 to 4? 
This is the one which people really love from Isaiah 2. This is our future hope and glory. That sounds nice, isn't it? Nation and nation, everyone goes to the temple of the Lord to learn his ways. There's no more weapons. Everyone is now farming. That sounds nice. And I look forward to that day. But who teaches the ways of the Lord? In chapter Verse 3. He will teach us his ways, so he may take us on his paths. This is the importance of following the Holy Spirit and the teachings of the Bible. Because God is the one who teaches us. And our future hope and glory is for that day when his new Zion comes. But let's look at the next verses that people really don't talk about. I'll read. House of Jacob, come and let us walk in the Lord's light, for you have abandoned your people, the house of Jacob, because they are full of divination from the east and of fortune tellers like the Philistines. They are in league with foreigners. Their land is full of silver and gold, and there is no limit to their treasures. Their land is full of horses, and there is no limit to their chariots. Their land is full of idols. They worship the work of their hands and what their fingers have made. So humanity is brought low, and each person is humbled. Do not forgive them. Go into the rocks and hide in the dust from the terror of the Lord and from his majestic splendor. The pride of mankind will be humbled and human loftiness will be brought low. The Lord alone will be exalted on that day. For a day belonging to the Lord of armies is coming against all that is proud and lofty, against all that is lifted up, It will be humbled against all the cedars of Lebanon, lofty and lifted up, against all the oaks of Bashan, against all the high mountains, against all the lofty hills, against every high tower, against every fortified wall, against every ship of Tarshish, against every splendid sea vessel. The pride of mankind will be brought low and human loftiness will be humbled. The Lord alone will be exalted on that day, the idols will vanish completely. People will go into caves in the rocks and holes in the ground, away from the terror of the Lord and from his majestic splendor, when he rises to terrify the earth. On that day, people will throw their silver and gold idols, which they have made to worship to the moles and the bats. They will go into the caves of the rocks and the crevices in the cliffs, away from the terror of the Lord and from his majestic splendor, when he rises to terrify the earth. Put no more trust in a mere human who has only the breath in his nostrils. What is he really worth? That's the truth. That's what you have to live for. 
every single thing not God will be destroyed. There is nothing that will survive that is not glorifying God. Your savings plans, your investments plans, your property portfolios, your career, your clothing outfits, your watch collections, your car collections, your whatever, your holidays, your experiences, your qualifications, the ministry, mysterious work you've done, it's going to be shut down, lowered, humbled, destroyed, removed. Unless you're here to glorify God. So you can see how it's so easy to listen to the churches, to fall into deception of habit. But when you really wanted to get to the nitty gritty of every single thing, whenever we put a stipulation on anything, we are still living for self. So for example, I will only do this type of work. I have not yet humbled myself to the Lord's will. I will only eat this type of food. I have not yet humbled myself to the Lord's will. I will focus on doing this with my money. You have not yet humbled yourself to the Lord's will. I will only do dress in this certain way. You have not humbled yourself to the Lord's will. Isaiah, a few chapters later, spent three years naked walking amongst Jerusalem. We won't go into Ezekiel. Hosea had to marry a prostitute. Walking with the Lord means you submit everything to Him. Every single part of your life becomes His. Now what the flesh does, and this is what the flesh does, I don't want to do that. That's not right. That's not fair. That's not, that's not, it's, it's my right. But the rest of the world, but, 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 but. But, 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 the rest of the world is going to perish. So why does it matter? If you're still thinking, but, 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 for this world, it means you, but, 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 don't actually believe the gospel. You're still living in false belief. You're under deception. You listen to the church, you like the social gathering of the church, or you like whatever the church brings you, you're not actually doing it to change. Because when Isaiah lifted, listed here in verses 13 onwards, Cedars of Lebanon, oaks of Bashan, high mountains, lofty hills, high tower, fortified walls, ships of Tarshish, every sea vessel. He's naming all of the things that the people then thought were amazing. In today's world, every iPhone, every investment portfolio, every business plan, every CV, every stock investment, every crypto account, Every whatever, it will all be brought low and humbled. So when we stop and we're thinking and trying to be honest with our lives... You need to stop and check. Am I being honest for my self-glorification or am I being honest for the glory of God? The glory of God will lead you only to one thing. Death. It will lead to you living a life of sacrifice. 
So let, let, let's break it down real school for how me and Danielle live our lives. We build up money. We work hard. I work hard. She works hard. Why? So we can help more kids get free therapy. The bigger my client network, the easier it's going to be for me to say this is free. The more money I earn per hour, the less stress there is to ask parents to pay. The harder Danielle works and trains therapists, the more kids we can help. If I learn how to invest money, it means maybe I don't have to ask someone to build a center for me, I can just rent another villa. Currently, I'm praying for a non-Christian to give me money, which within itself is a non-biblical debate because the Bible says, do not attach yourself to foreigners. Like if you wanted to get really nasty with our walk, me believing a non-Christian is going to fund the therapy center is non-biblical because the New Testament and Old Testament literally says, do not tie yourself with foreigners. So I shouldn't even be thinking about going into business with non-born again Christians. There's a man, George Muller. He, he raised, he bought and built, I think, three or four orphanages by prayer alone. And he refused to accept money from anyone not a Christian. Because that's what the word of God said. And he's a man who'd walk. He had no money for food. He himself hadn't eaten. There was hardly any, there was no money left to buy the orphans food and people would literally run up to him. Oh my gosh, the Holy Spirit told me I need to give you this money now. Oh, thank you. This is enough to pay our coal bill for today. So for us, when we look at our lives, everything we're doing is trying to build next door. It's hard. It's really hard. It's very stressful. It's why times like last Sunday can sometimes happen. But when it gets hard, we have to get stronger in the Lord and sit, Lord, your will, not ours. I don't want, I don't want to do this life, God. But I know it's your will. And even we were talking about it this morning, it's so hard. But that's the truth of our lives and it's the discussions we have and it's how we pray and how we sit into it because we're going, Lord, I'm not building money back home. I'm not trying to build a house in the UK. I'm not thinking about investing in Spain. I'm not thinking of setting up permanent residency here and creating a business so I can retire. I'm just thinking, how can I build something to serve the vision God's given me? And that's what we do. Everything we do is built to somehow create this vision God's given us of a community house that helps the needy and through that the manifest presence of God falls which brings people to Christ. Where the kids come in broken and disabled and they walk out healed on the same day. We've seen foreshadows of this as kids have entered and they start talking when they've never talked before. We've seen foreshadows of healing as kids have left here free from autism, but they're just foreshadows of the glory God's promised us if we're obedient to him. But then you then have to think, how do you live your lives? What's the honest truth when you sit down and go, what am I doing with my money? Because that's what it all boils down to. That's why Jesus says you'll only serve God or money. Money is the biggest devil to people. And you say, what do I do with my money? Am I using it to build a vision of God or am I using it to build a vision of me? Because vision of God is going to be realistically one thing. Helping the broken hearted of society. Fighting injustice. Because that's what the Bible talks about. Being a voice for the afflicted. Who's helping the orphans and widows. In the Psalms it talks about God answers the cries of the orphans and widows. The people that have afflicted by war. Are we building things to help those people? 
our build is to the children that are rejected in society. There are many noble callings. There are many disabled people across the world that are rejected in society. On top of that, Malawi, Nigeria, how many street kids in China, how many orphanages there are where kids are just abandoned. Are we using our resources to help them? How about in the war-torn countries like Somalia where the men are just killed and the women are left raped? Are we then using our investment to build a restaurant for these people to eat for free where we choose to work and so they can have luxury? Or are we using our money to help people at home that are then just being fat and lazy? Because again, that's another truth, another deception of being an expat. You know, even Danielle was sharing yesterday when she was talking to her sister about how her sister's paying so much to help the dad. And I was like, oh, I just want to, maybe we should send some money home to help and feel bad. I'm like, no, that's not what God's called us to. That's not our ministry. But it can be so easy for me to be tied up into things that aren't the ministry work right now. If they haven't asked, we don't give. If they ask, we'll give. But they haven't asked. So why am I going to jump the gun and start trying to help where God's not told me to help? We trust God to provide for them. That's what God's told us. But traps of an expat, and you see it across the whole world, from South Africa, from South America, to Africa, to the Asian continents. There's always one person who's the punk, who goes out to work 24-7, so everyone else back home doesn't have to work. It's true. Malawi is true. It's true in your situation. Nigeria, I know it's true. China, I'm not sure if it's true like this in China. But I know in South America, it's so common that people from South America go to America. One person gets a job, so the whole family gets to stay at home. And the reason is, oh, well, it's poverty. There's nothing for them to do. It's rubbish. It's laziness. There's always investments and in business that can be done. There's always work that can be done. It's just people being lazy. The Bible says, do not feed the lazy scoffers. Especially if they're claiming to be Christian and they don't want to work, you don't feed them. But that in itself is a trap from the devil. To steal your money. From doing what it's meant to be used for. Helping the broken hearted in society. Wherever you look in the world there is going to be broken hearted people that a ministry should be helping. And it should be starting in the place God's placed you. First and foremost, the churches and the letters supported their communities and the excess went back to Jerusalem to help the poor there. So you think us as a ministry, what are we doing in this area to help? What are we doing as individuals within our homes to help? Because any answer that isn't, they need it more than me, is still greed. Freely you receive, freely you give. If you believe you don't have enough, you believe God's not going to provide your needs. You know, I can just go on and on about so many different examples that I know we all go through. But I think you're getting the point. When we listen to the tradition of church elders, when we, listen, when we just take teachings of churches as gospel, you don't get to know God. When you don't get to know God by studying his word day in and day out, you start to fall under deception. Now I'm not saying you all get to this point today where it's like, he's right, let me just, Control, alt, delete, give everything away and start helping the poor. <coughs> no. Well, unless Holy Spirit tells you to do that, go to town. I'm not going to tell you don't do that. But what's the takeaway? It's actually stopping and reflecting now. As I feel God pulling me and Danielle into a deeper season of dying, it's going, I'm going to pull the people that want to come. I want to pull the people that want to come deeper into that death. Because in the death for you comes the glory of God. The disciples didn't receive the glory 
until they die to self. So when you sit in here, and I want to say this, and it's the real truth of coming to this church. You can grieve the Holy Spirit. It's the one unforgivable sin. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Do not lie to the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 5 shows that people that lie to the Holy Spirit died. Ananias and Sapphira, they died. I want to raise up a church that wants to die to self. That wants to lay down its rights in a city that's all about self, that's all about greed, that's all about using people. I want people that come here to lay it down and just say, I'm here to die. I'm here to give up every single one of my rights as a human being in the same way that Jesus gave up every single right as the almighty Lord of God, Lord of hosts, to come as a man, we give up every single one of our rights as a human being in order to be used by God. It's not comfortable. It's not nice. But that's the truth that's going to make you survive the day of the Lord. And that's what my job is. My job is to preach the truth, to lead people to God. The way to lead people to God is to do what Jesus said, leave the dead to the dead. Sell all you have, give to the poor. Don't worry about the things of the world. Just pick up your cross and follow me. Because then when you follow Jesus, what happens? He gets the glory because it's not about you anymore. You look different than the whole world. They look at you and they go, what the heck are you? You're a fool. You live like a fool. What do you mean you don't save money? What do you mean you don't try and build an empire? What do you mean you don't care what job you do? What do you mean? What do you mean? Why are you giving me your food? What do you mean? What do you mean? I don't understand. You don't need to understand. Just understand Jesus loves you. And he died for you in the same way he died for me. And he can set you free from the pain of this world. Because it is painful. When you're worrying about what to do for work, money, clothes, this. Stressful. What's not stressful is knowing your God and sitting back and saying, God, I give it all away. Now I live for you. And now you understand Paul when he says, I want to die, but I don't want to die. To die is to gain for me, but I know I've got to stay here for you. And that's the fundamental truth. The truth of a Christian is to embrace death. We should run to it. Because we don't live for this world anymore. We live for Isaiah 2, 1 to 4. The beautiful time when the Lord reigns, everyone comes to him. There's no more swords and spears. We all get to farm, grow our crops. The waters flow out of Jerusalem. We're in the holy city, surrounded by the presence of God. The lion and the lamb and the toddler sleep together, play together. There is no more illness, disease. There's no more depression. Wow. That's what we want to get to. But in order to get to it, you've got to die. To die means it's no longer you that lives, but God that lives in you. Which means you have to be honest with yourself, with your truths, and then be willing to submit. Because he will poke you, he will prod you, he will challenge you. It's up to you if you accept or reject. So for me, it's just that honest truth of... If you want to come to this church, come in the knowledge you're coming to die. Come in the knowledge that every week you want to die more. That when you worship, it's worshipping in spirit and in truth to die more. 
to chase his presence and his glory, which comes when you die more. The more you die, the more he comes. Because there's nothing else worth living for. That day of the Lord will come. And when it comes, where will you be? And if you sit and reflect in honesty today, we're all falling short now. I know I've been. And it's a season God's pushing me. So if he's pushing me, that means those that come here are going to get pushed in that same way. And that's what I've always done. When I preach, when I teach, it's what God's pushing me in. So he's pushing his church here to die to self. I challenge you all, if you want to come, come, but come being ready to die. If you haven't been baptized properly, be baptized properly. Proper baptism is a swim. Fully under, fully up. It's when you make a conscious decision to die to self. It's that moment in, you, in your life when you get on your knees and you go, ah, I'm done. That life of holiness, I want it. I'm committed to your church, to your body. I'm committed to die for your will. So you go fully underwater, fully submerged, and you come up. That water has washed you clean and every essence of the old man or woman is gone. And you then go, Lord, now I need your Holy Spirit. This life of self-sacrifice cannot be done without you. Please do it. And you stay there and you yield and you yield under his presence and he'll break you and he'll break you. Till he tears away every ounce of greed Every bitter root in your heart, he rips it out. Until you have love. So you have an ability to love those who are unlovable. And then your journey begins. And then and only then does your journey begin. And once that journey begins, it's then that lessons of obedience. That's your first step. Proper baptism. An honest baptism because an honest baptism leads you into the curse laid out in the letter of Hebrews uh, th this is where I wanted to close today in the letter of Hebrews it's that one portion of scripture no one likes to talk about who knows what I'm talking about no one knows what I'm talking about because no one likes to talk about it. But it's the bit that says, for those people who have renounced the gospel of Christ, there's no more further redemption for them. You cannot crucify Christ twice. And therefore, they are set apart for eternal damnation, irrespective of their repentance. It's in Hebrews 5, 6, 7, something like this. And it lays about it. It says, those who choose to sin cannot receive the forgiveness of Christ. Because you cannot crucify Christ twice. The church don't teach about this. But the truth is, if you've received a correct baptism, where you've truly decided to die to self, you can't imagine anything worse than openly choosing to reject Christ. There is nothing worse than rejecting your Lord and Saviour. Now I've stumbled. We all stumble. We all make mistakes. And that's where the forgiveness of God comes in. But there's a difference between making an accidental slip and swear and getting angry and losing your temper than choosing to have a boyfriend. Than choosing to steal than choosing to live for someone not for God and that's the, that's the horrible truth because when we then look at understand that scripture and we then go to Acts chapter 5 and they were confronted with the theft and lying to the Holy Spirit there was no forgiveness 
instant wrath of God. And you see now why you shouldn't listen to the churches. The churches don't teach you the truth. The truth is, Paul warns about the reason many sicker and dying is because they're taking communion in an unworthy manner. The unworthy manner is the state of sin in your life. The reason most of the church are not dead yet is because they were never baptized correctly. It's because they haven't chosen to die for self. And that's what baptism is. Baptism is that moment in your life when you truly go, I have decided to die to my hopes, my dreams, my ambitions, my comforts, my rights as a human being that the devil tells me I deserve. Because you don't deserve a nice house. You don't deserve nice clothes. You don't deserve a nice career. You don't deserve a nice husband, a nice wife. You don't deserve anything. The only thing you deserve is the fair judgment and wrath of God for being an evil created being. We get given the grace of God through the sacrifice of Jesus to be forgiven, to be washed clean so we can start again as his children which starts your life of obedience, which brings you to change, which brings you to that reflection of, have I actually changed from the sermons I'm listening to? Or am I just listening for the sake of listening? So it's a time for reflection for everyone. To come to this church means that conscious decision to die to yourself. That conscious, hard, painful decision to take the Bible for what the Bible says. To take every single teaching given to you outside of the Bible, put it in a nice ball and throw it in the fire where it belongs. To come to this church means you're going to study the Bible every day. Because if you don't study the Bible every day, you don't know if what I'm telling you is true or not. If you study the Bible every day, you'll recognize 70% of what I'm talking about is actually just quoting scriptures. Just because I don't go Matthew 5, 11, no, 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 no. You don't see that anywhere in the Bible. Jesus just worded the scriptures. Paul just worded the scriptures. Theologians and clever people later later on cross-reference them to the Old Testament. Talking in the Spirit is not going Matthew 5, 11 and John 2, 12 and Obadiah 1, 9. It's not in there. That's the way of man. Talking in the scriptures, quoting God's word naturally and fluidly in a poetic way. Because God talks in poetry. So it's to study God's word every day. Because you've realized if you don't know God's word, you're going to be tricked by the devil. If the devil tried to play Jesus with the Bible, guess what he's going to try and do to you? He will twist you up faster. And it's how we're talking about here. You speak speak to a Muslim. You try and evangelize a Muslim here. They will tongue-tie most Christians under the carpet. But it's true. Who's here, who here has tried to evangelize a Muslim? And you know the questions they ask and they will make you shake and tremble like, oh my gosh, I don't know anything. And they will rip your faith apart. And if that in yourself doesn't make you go, I need to quote this more and know this more and know history more, you've also got a problem. So you need to study this day in, day out, day in, day out. Over and over. Different versions. Because sadly, English is dumb. It's not clever language like Greek, Hebrew or Arabic. It's a dumb language. Different versions. NIV, NLT, CSB, New King James, Old King James, Amplified, Message, Passion. 
All of them. To then come to this church means honest conversations of how are you changing? How are you choosing to die to self every week? You should all be able to come to this rug every time at 9am and be like, this week the Holy Spirit has smacked me with this. He got a baseball bat and he showed me, boof, this thing needs to die. Or he got a big spotlight, zoom, on this big thing on my heart. And it's then, please help me pray for it. Because that's what it means to walk with God. The, the biggest concern is when people come to an open table of confession and they have nothing to confess. If we can go, oh, the week's been blessed and the week's been good and nothing's gone wrong in my life and the Holy Spirit hasn't convicted me, guess what? You're not a child of God. Because, again, back to Hebrews, God disciplines his children. So, you will be disciplined and every week there must be things that you can go, <laughs> help me, I'm being disobedient to this, I'm being a naughty child. Because uh, God knows that's why I'm, I'm very much like this. Like, every time we go to worship in the beginning, I've got to, I've got to get it out. Right? I, just, just, I just be silly. Because naturally I just want to go off and do my own thing, claiming to be led by the Spirit. But I'm not anointed as the worship leader. That's her position. So when I'm trying to run off, oh, that's where the Holy Spirit's leading me. No, it's not, Eloi. That's my imagination. Holy Spirit puts her as the worship leader, so I have to fall under her submission. So next time you'll notice, she does... She has hand signals now that I have to follow. And you'll notice sometimes she has to do it twice because I've already gone off in my own little planet and I'm, I, I'm wandering away. So before we worship, I have to practice and I've got to get this, this thing out of me that makes me want to go... <laughs> we always have things that God's working on us on because we are disobedient little children. And that's how God treats us because that's the truth of what we are. Children, you give them an inch, they take a mile. Kids in Dubai, you give them an inch, they take 10 miles. So when we understand the battle we're facing in this city, the spirit that rules this city, you understand how much more important it is to be obedient because this is a city of give and take. Where everyone takes Everyone breaks the rules. Everyone takes advantage. No one plays by the system. The system doesn't even follow the system. It's a city of carnage and disruality, all based around greed. So how important is it for us as children of God to be making sure we're falling under the conviction every single day? So it means being honest with yourself every day, every week. That You should be able to come to this place and be mm, either I've had some crazy revelations from the word of God. Every time I go through beginning to end, I get new revelations. Every time. Every time you go through it, you're like, I don't believe that. I've never noticed that before. Like even here, like this was when I got a couple of weeks ago in Genesis. And Danielle got it this morning, like uh, we were talking about it this morning. And we talked about it and I was like, wow. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? In Genesis 2, verse 9. 
the Lord God caused to grow out of the ground every tree pleasing in appearance pleasing for appearance that God made the trees so that they would be pleasing for us to look at God made the trees and the flowers so that we could enjoy looking at his creation. <laughs> How many times I've read Genesis? I, don't, I can't even count. And he made every tree that was pleasing in appearance so we could enjoy the beauty of his hand. Wow. That was a new revelation I got a couple of weeks ago. Danielle got it this, uh, a couple of days ago and we were talking about it this morning. No matter how many times you go through this book, you will have new revelations. So if every single person here is reading the Bible every single day, you should be able to come here every Sunday with, Bruh, have you read Obadiah? Oh, not, not in about six. You know this in here. This is what it sounds like. Wow, that's a deep revelation. We must always, we, like, to, to not come with a revelation from the word of God says you are not nourished by the word of God. I'm sure we can all talk about a nice meal we had. I know I had a nice steak the other day. I can talk about that. But we should be able to talk more about the nourishment we've had from here. So every day, people in this church must be beginning to end people. Over and over. You get to the end, you go back to the beginning. You must have a version you are reading beginning to end. If, you're, if English isn't your strength, pick your native language. If your native language isn't your strength... Pick the message translation. It's the Harry Potter version of the Bible. Very easy reading. You study the word in the country you're in, in the language you're in. You must know the word of God in English and you must be fluent in English. How can you evangelize in an English-speaking country if your English is not good? I personally believe if you are a true... The churches here should preach in two languages. Or three. English... Urdu and Arabic and that's it you shouldn't be preaching in Filipino Telugu Indian this, Hindi, Chinese or Tele or T well, no it's the languages of the common man of the land we're in which is English, Arabic and Urdu those are the three common languages of Dubai so us as a church must teach in either of these three common languages why? to raise up the congregation so that you are equipped to evangelize in either of those three languages. Uh, this is relevant only really for you, Lily, but it's true. The Chinese population is very small in Dubai. So why are we teaching in Chinese? We all must have better English, or better Arabic, or better Urdu, to reach those people. So you should study in the language you're going to evangelize in. You may not be a street evangelist, but you're on a bus, you're on a train, you're walking the streets. You're walking the streets. Your English must be at a level which you can converse with fluently the message and gospel of Christ to anyone in this city. If you don't speak Arabic or Urdu, then you're stuck with English. I know God convicts me to try and speak Arabic and try and learn it, but my gosh, I'm barely struggling with Spanish. So you must study this every day. In the language you know you're going to be preaching. And so for you, Lily, with going to New Zealand, really important. Get strong in the word in English. In New Ze in English, Because in New Zealand, they only speak English. And you need to be strong and fluent to, 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 to give that foundational knowledge for the Holy Spirit to teach in English to people. After studying the word every single day, and being in a position to get revelation to teach and to share. Because realistically, I should be able to sit down every Sunday and go, Ronnie, your revelations from your Bible study this week, please teach to us. I know I can do it to Danielle because she, she studies the Bible every day. She has more notebooks filled with notes than then we can shake a notebook at. My conviction is I don't write enough notes. I just sort of trust something will come out when I have to talk. 
I prefer to read over and over compared to read and write notes. She's read and write notes. I'm read and read and read. Well, we all must have something. We should have that confidence because the Lord can use anyone. And it says, Lily shared a few weeks ago, it can't just be Eloy. No, it can't just be me. Well, if you're not reading the word, you're not in a position to teach. So I should be able to sit down and then point. What was your teaching? What did you learn from the Lord this week? What portions of scripture did you start at? And where have you gone? Uh, I didn't read this week. Why not? Work was busy. Okay, so work is your idol. Now we must spend some time in repentance. So we all must study and read. From there we all must be ready to die. Which means that honest time in prayer before the Lord where you let him search your heart. Because that's what the scripture says. He will search your heart. And he will change. Two masters cannot be in the same vessel. So we all should be able to come to this rug or that table and go, this is uncomfortable for me because the flesh doesn't want me to talk about my sin. But yeah, this week, this has been my conviction. And I know it's hard. It's very hard. But that position only comes if you're being honest. And if you can't be honest with man, guess what? (laughs) No way you're being honest with Holy Spirit. Because that's what the Bible says. It says, if you can't love your brother, how can you love someone you can't see? If you can't fall under the authority of man, how can you say you're falling under the authority of God you can't see? So therefore, if you can't be honest with man, how are you being honest with You're just deceiving yourself in prayer. So you must then be open to dying to self, which means you should be able to come every week and be like, this is the season I'm in. And sometimes it can be the same season. It can take time for a weed to get pulled out because you've got to make sure there's no other weeds, but you must be able to come and go, yeah... God's working on this thing in me. Great, let's pray over it. And that links on to the third and final thing. It's that being honest to you of have you died to self. If you haven't... If you haven't yet honestly died to self... Huh? I did, but he tried to call me. Um... If you have done that honest dying to self, or yeah, sorry, if you haven't done that honest dying to self, taking that step and saying, I want to be baptized properly to die to self, and I want to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is the ability to live in this world for God and not for my selfish desires. And you then go for a swim. But there's a preparatory period for that. You've got to check your heart, check your honesty. Spend time in prayer and fasting. And from there, it's then your commitment. That if you're coming here, it's because you want that journey. You want to partake in that journey. It's because you've realized the ways of the world, they're not fruitful anymore. They're not helping me. I've realized Isaiah chapter 2 is real. The day of the Lord's going to come. Trumpets burning. People fleeing and hiding. I don't want to be in that crowd. I want to be in the crowd that goes with Jesus. And you guys, that's what I want. And you try and run to that at all costs. Which brings you back to point one and point two. So it's that nice circle of honesty as family. Makes sense? Because it's a hard season coming. It's a hard season coming for this church. But God has promised much to this church. He has promised much to the city of Dubai, but to where much is expected. We have to do much. 
and it's not me. It's us as the body of Christ. It's us working. It's us working together as a family, which means some are intercessors, some are voices, some are instruments. Everyone has different parts, but it's then being open to be used as a part. And that only happens if you know step one, step two. Because as you go through step one, step two, we can start to align. It's taken us almost three months for me, Danielle, and Ines to start working together to align. And that came as a result of what happened last Sunday where some conversations we had about working out how we can align better against the attacks that the devil constantly puts on this house. He always, was it? Uh, he, the devil always attacks worship. Always. And we were saying, gosh, even always, 8.30, 8.45, like this, something stupid happens that me and Danielle argues. Every time. Now we've put a stand against it. Now we intercede before worship. And this is the first Sunday we haven't bickered before church. What it takes working as a unit, which only comes if, like, like for example, Ronnie, uh, just a silly example. Oh, I'm on the bus. There's always two Filipinos, uh, one Bangladeshi and one Sri Lankan and one Indian. Okay, find out what language the Indian is. Telugu. Okay, great. Are they Christian? No. Are they born again? Are they Christian? Yes. Are they born again? No. Okay, good. Then how can you get them? Well, I'm not too sure. Well, let's start praying for these people. Let's get their names. Let me get you some tracks. I'll go to the Bible bookstore because I can go to the Bible bookstore and I'll give you tracks to give to them. Pray and intercede how you can teach the message to these people. The people in your flat, the people in your jobs, the people in your flats. If they're not saved, why not? How can we save them? Are we praying for them? Are we making active steps to evangelize them? Are we being an example of a self-sacrificial servant to them? Silly example. Student life. Room shares, student life. Like... And it's like, are we cleaning up the dirty dishes that they leave there? Or are we shouting going, hey, punk, clean your dishes. There's only one pot. Or are we going, oh, okay, it's okay. I'll clean it for them and I'll use it and I'll cook my food. And here, I'll put a nice Tupperware. I know you're busy and stressed out. Here's a nice bit of cake for you for tomorrow. Silly example. But it's a, it's a practical real life example for us to sort of check our heart posture. Because our heart posture should be, hmm, they're not saved. They need this cake more than I do. They need that time to do the dishes more than I do. Because if they don't sleep, God won't sustain them. If I don't sleep, God will sustain me. If I don't eat, God will sustain me. Because I know my God can do everything. Why? Because I know him well enough. Why? Because I study him every day. And I know God's with me. Why? Because every day he convicts me of sin. Every day he's disciplining me. So I know I'm a son and daughter. And I know I can step into the glory. I can step into those promises. Because I'm doing my part. And that's why people then don't have faith to self-sacrifice. Because they know they're not doing their part. So they know they can't step into the glory of sacrifice. So those are the takeaway points from today. Don't listen to the church. Don't listen to me. Listen to this. You'll know you're listening to this if you want to study it. If you don't want to study it, you're not yet born again. Because if you're born again, you've recognized this is your daily bread. This is the only thing. And I've realized now, even on my Sabbath, on my sleeping day, I still wake up earlier than everyone else. And I get at least half an hour in the Word. Because if I don't do this every day, I become very grumpy. 
I become snappy. The old man starts to like, I've got a space. I've got a space. He hasn't had breakfast yet. He's hungry. I've got a space. I can do some terrorism here. And that's what can happen on Saturdays if I'm not careful. And it's happened a few Saturdays in the past. So, <laughs> To then come to this church is to commit to a church. Commit. And when you commit, it's like a marriage. You're all in. So... It's turning up to every single prayer meeting. If you don't have a job. You don't have a job, there's nothing you can you have sorry, you have a job, there's nothing you can do about it. You work until nine PM. It's turning up if you have nothing else to do. It's studying the word. It's doing what needs to be done in the city around you to help and love the poor, to love the broken hearted. It's not living for self. I'm really in this mood where I don't want people to come who are going to live for self anymore. It's time to die. Us as a church needs to die. I'm walking around and I'm seeing how broken this city is, how many people are going to hell, and it's because we haven't died to self. God's heart is for them. And he says, if there is just one heart for intercession. But while we're still focusing on what we're doing, we're not dead to self. And it's why the glory doesn't come. It's why the miracles don't happen. It's why the people don't get saved. Because all they see is self. They haven't yet seen God. So it's to build a church that are now dying active in death to self which means if you turn up you're turning up in the confidence that you've studied the scripture from Sunday to Sunday you've taken the sermons and you've gone let me find something to implement and I want to come and share a testimony It's to say, I want to turn up and have a conviction of sin and I want to be able to confess publicly where I'm falling short. Because that's what the Bible tells us to do in the letter of James. Publicly confess your sins to your elders and you will be healed. I'm tired. Well, maybe there's sins to confess. I've got allergies. <laughs> I've got allergies. Maybe there's sins for me to confess. I don't know. I've got to spend time with that. I had, yesterday, I had a very bad allergy attack for four or five hours, nonstop sneezing, wiped me out, exhausted. You understand what I'm saying now. The time for self is over. The time for God has come. America has gone too far. Canada has gone too far. UK and Europe have gone too far. We found out we were researching in Germany, 2017. The law was passed in Germany that parents could mark babies as non-binary. Um, Five years ago, in Germany, that law was passed for parents to be allowed to say a child is not a male or a female, even if they've got the obvious male or female parts. To let the child have a decision if they want to be a boy. Five years ago, in Germany, that happened. So we can think and look. The world, the time is near. And it's time then for those who want to come here to be honest to grow now. It's a time to grow. I'm not going to tell you it's easy. I'm going to tell you it's hard. But the one promise I will give you, and it's the promise that God says, is you will have an eternal relationship with him. And where he is, you can endure all things. Why? Because when Jesus had all of the skin off his back, he'd carried a cross, been spit on, been ridiculed, then was nailed to the cross, and then was mocked. That was a lot of pain. What was he able to say? Lord, please forgive them, for they know not what they do. If our Lord could go through that and still say that, and he offers us to do greater things than that, 
I can promise you, no matter how hard your life gets, you will be able to have the grace of the Lord to love and forgive those who may mistreat you. And it's not easy. But through discipline and obedience to him, you will get there. And that's the people I want coming to this church. Because it only needs two or three. There's already two, three. This side is set. It's your choices how you want to live your lives. But at least you can be in the knowledge that when that day comes, you can't point to me and go, why didn't you tell me? I can go, no. On the 16th of October, 2022, every single one of you here today was told, your hearts are corrupt. We're all still living for self. I can point out every single one of you right now, which things are in your hearts and your lives. That's what Holy Spirit does. It tells us. That's the truth of prophecy. Seeing into hearts. And it's your opportunities, it's your choices how to live. You can hide from the pain of past trauma. You can hide from the pain of loneliness. Or you can just yield it to the Lord and become his vessel. You can yield the greed and enjoy how much more fun it is to give. Because it is. It's very hard in that step of giving. But when you find someone the Lord has led you to and the Lord gives you, prompts you to give a generous gift to those people, and you do. I remember the first time it happened to me. It was to Brother Lamptey. You met Lamptey. And I still remember it to this day. God said to me, give him X amount. And I'm like, no. <laughs> Ridiculous. No. <laughs> let me at least speak to him first. Yeah, I spoke to him. Oh, well, let me get his number. I got his number. And when I saw like his thing was a Christian thing, I was like, oh, Lord. Let me first take him for lunch. <laughs> oh, so I first then took him for lunch. And then I was like, okay, I've got his story. How much is it that, that your problem is forcing you? And it was the exact number God had told me to give him. And I then repented to him. I said, I'm so sorry. I was meant to give this to you two days ago. But I had to check. <laughs> I didn't trust. I was like, that's a large amount of money. God, I wanted. But I'm telling you, once you learn how to give away the things of the world, there's no going back. I miss the days. I do miss the days when we used to go to union co-op and just give out freely. I miss the days when we used to, we used to walk, the, to take the dogs on our walk and we'd always carry a flask of tea with food Biscuits, and we'd because we'd see them every morning, the rubbish collectors, Martin, and we'd stop, we'd give them tea, biscuits. How are you? How's your day? Stand next to them, next to the stinky rubbish truck. Have a nice day. Run, rain, sun, sleep or shine, they would get their tea and biscuits. Since moving here, we don't come across the rubbish collectors. Maybe every other day we'll maybe see someone sweeping, but this is it. I miss those days. But we all have those opportunities before us of how we can start to love the people around us. We just need to be honest with the Holy Spirit to use us. Shall we go back into that last song I said? Time, yeah? So I'm just gonna bring us into one more song of worship. And I really want you to take it as this time now, just five minutes, ten minutes. Just to take the teachings and the honesty of the reflections. To sit and make your covenants with God. Because it's not about with me or the house, it's between you and God. And you can say, Lord, where, where's my conviction? Where's my hunger for the word? And it's that vow, you go, you know what?